As it's Biology Week, it really does seem entirely appropriate that the focus of today's talk is environmental change in Antarctica, one of the only areas of the planet covered by an international treaty which protects the environment and acknowledges its importance for all humanity. It's also, of course, the only continent without a native human population. Um, and we're extremely grateful to Professor Lloyd Peck and that he's a great for, his, for her agreeing to speak to us tonight. The importance of his research and the high regard in which it is held, as well as his reputation as a science communicator, means that we're very fortunate that he is with us. Lloyd has made many visits to the coldest, driest, windiest and most isolated place on Earth. And his research is centred around how organisms are adapted to such extreme and hostile conditions. And I always find it surprising to remember that since these organisms almost exclusively occupy marine habitats, this means that working in Antarctica as a biologist also involves being underwater in those conditions. And other than that, all it remains for me to say is, Lloyd, we're really looking forward to what you have to say. And thank you for coming and being with us. Lloyd, over to you. Well, first off, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to come and give a talk. Um, I am an enthusiast about biology in Antarctica and especially marine biology. I've been working in Antarctic marine biology for over 30 years, for a long time. And I don't go there because of the, the buzz and the environment. I would have stopped after five or six years. I go there because of the science questions. And as I delve deeper and deeper into those questions, more and more arise. So I'm going to give you a talk about the adaptations of Antarctic animals. I'll start with a little bit about the environment, then about the adaptations and why the animals living there are fundamentally different from animals living elsewhere. Then towards the end, I'll look at how those adaptations affect their abilities to respond to climate change. So the talk is about adaptations of Antarctic marine animals and how that affects their abilities to respond to change. All of the animals you see on this screen are animals that live in the Antarctic. They're all animals that me or my team have worked on and researched over the past two or three decades. I hope to dispel a few myths and I hope to show people in the audience some things that they already know, but also some things that they don't know. So let's start. The Antarctic, as Hillary said, it's the world's coldest, it's the driest, it's the highest, and it's the windiest continent. And a big part of that is because of the block of ice that sits over this part of the continent, East Antarctica. And the East Antarctic is the size of Europe. The total Antarctic continent is about 15 million square kilometers. It's twice the size of Australia. It's a big place. And this part of the continent, the East Antarctic, has a block of ice over it that averages two miles thick. So that would be a block of ice over the whole of Europe, two miles thick. That accounts for three quarters of the fresh water on Earth. So if you add up all the fresh water in the rivers on Earth, the lakes on Earth, the ice in the Arctic, the ice on mountain tops, put all of that together, there is three times as much fresh water in Antarctica as there is everywhere else. That's why even a small amount of melting of this ice cap will mean significant impact elsewhere. The continent itself is 99% covered in ice. There's only 1% poking through in the mountain chains or around the continental margins for life on land. But it's very different under the sea. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the marine environment and what that's like. And again, in the sidebar on the right is animals that live in the sea, in the Antarctic, on the seabed. What we have here are slices, temperature slices, through the Pacific Ocean on the left and the Atlantic Ocean on the right. And the dark data are the average temperature for each site along the latitudinal range in the Pacific, from the poles in the Arctic to the polar regions in the Antarctic and the tropics in between. 
what we see is a monotonic increase and decrease in temperature from the poles to the tropics in average temperatures. So the polar regions are colder than anywhere else. The white data are on the right hand axis and they are the variability, the annual range in temperature. And if we look in the Atlantic, we can see that roughly where we are, there's 10, 12, 13 degrees of temperature variation during the year, which is a lot of variation. If we go to the poles, the temperature variation is close to zero. So the poles are cold and very low variation in temperatures. The tropics are hot with low variation and in between you have intermediate temperatures with high variation. So the polar regions are unusual. Antarctica is unusual because the temperatures are close to zero throughout the year and the variation is close to zero throughout the year. And it's been like that for many millions of years, at least 15 million years in some parts of the Antarctic and maybe as much as 25 million years in some of the deep embayments in Antarctica. These are data from the station that I work at. And what they show you is, and it's one of the more variable temperature environments in the sea in the Antarctic. So in the winter time, temperatures are close to minus 1.9, the freezing point of, of seawater. And in the springtime, they shoot up to temperatures near plus one. So we've got a temperature range of two and a half, maybe three degrees some years throughout the whole year. In contrast to that, the phytoplankton bloom is shown in the lower panel. And these are chlorophyll concentrations. And when I show these to oceanographers, they fall off their chairs because chlorophyll concentrations of 20, 25 and 30 milligrams of chlorophyll per meter cubed are way more intense than they are in the North Sea or the North Atlantic. These are the concentrations within about 10 kilometers of the coast. If you go further offshore, the blooms are less intense, but in the fields and close inshore in the Antarctic within 10 kilometers, you get very intense phytoplankton blooms. At 30 milligrams of chlorophyll per meter cubed, a scuba diver can't see their hand at arm stretch from their face because of the life in the water. It's the only place where you can also sit on the seabed, look up through the water column and see phytoplankton because the phytoplankton are really large. Some of them are colonial and they form green hairs that you can see in the water with the naked eye. So we have very constant temperatures compared to elsewhere. We have massive variation in phytoplankton food supplies. And that's related to the big variation in, in insulation in the sun's rays, which go from 24 hours light in the middle of summer to 24 hours dark for several months in the winter time. And this seasonality has a big effect on the biology as well. You can see another effect of this seasonality. Here we have satellite images of the Antarctic in late winter and late summer. And the difference between the two pictures is the extent of sea ice around the continent. And the continent just about doubles in size in the winter. 12 to 15 million square kilometers of sea ice form and melt every year in the Antarctic. And I've been to the Antarctic and I just have problems envisaging that. Areas twice the size of Australia freeze and melt around the Antarctic. And this has global scale consequences. That amount of white reflecting light has a big effect on the temperature in the planet. So losing that sea ice has a big consequence. The cold water in the Antarctic also drives thermohaline circulation. So losing that cold and the sea ice will have big consequences in the future. For biology, on the seabed, there's another major factor, and that's the isolation. And most people don't know about the isolation of the Antarctic. Here's an image of the Antarctic with its continental shelf shown in light blue. And all the, con all the continents have continental shelves, but the Antarctic is the only continent that does not have a continental shelf link to another continent. So animals living on the continental shelf can't walk along the continental shelf or swim along the continental shelf floor to another continent, which means the Antarctic is isolated in a way that other continents are not. A further 
isolation factor is the circulation of the Southern Ocean. And it, this is the only place on Earth where a wave can start on one part of the globe, go all the way around the Earth and come back to the same place without hitting land. And that's why the biggest seas on Earth are in the Drake's Passage between South America and Antarctica, regularly with 40 and 50 foot waves going through this gap between the continents. What this also does is it stops currents bringing propagules, bringing larvae from other continents into Antarctica. And this isolation has been here for around 30 million years. So we've got an isolated continent. We've got it in extreme conditions compared to the rest of the globe. And that has led to some of the most unusual and bizarre, and in my opinion, precious animals anywhere. So we think of the Antarctic. And if we think of the Southern Ocean, we think of this, an ice covered wasteland. And yes, for sure, it is like that. This is the station where I do most of my work, rather a station in the Antarctic in the summertime and there's open water with lots of ice in it and the icebergs where that we see there can get up to the size of five or six football pitches across the top and maybe as much as a billion tons. We go out in the summer in little boats and we scuba dive and we work on animals on the seabed. If the ice is brash we can still work. It's not so easy to work in but we can still do that. In the winter time the sea freezes over we pull out the five foot chainsaw, we cut holes in the ice, and then we go diving through the ice to work year round. And my team works year round. I have people there 365 days of the year, and we do seasonal experiments. We look at the periods when the animals basically switch their metabolism off to reduce the energy costs during winter. Most people, when they think of the Antarctic, they think of the Animals that are most like us, the furry ones, the cute ones, and we, they have some really interesting adaptations to surviving the cold and the seasonality. But that's not where the really interesting biology is, and that's not where the unusual biology is. That's on the seabed, with the life on the seabed. Now, most people think that biodiversity falls rapidly and dramatically towards the poles. But on the seabed, this is a typical photograph of a piece of protected seabed at 15 to 20 metres depth in Antarctica, away from the worst of the ice scour. And so far, over 8,000 species of invertebrates and fish have been described from that seabed in the Antarctic. And the estimates are that there are somewhere between 17 and 20,000 species of animals living on the seabed. And that's a similar number to South America or Europe. So the idea that the diversity and the biodiversity is depauperate in the polar regions is just not true on the seabed in the Antarctic. So the low temperatures have an effect and low temperature affects everything. It affects bio biochemical reactions and that leads through to enzyme reactions and then into growth development, metabolism, everything. So a bit of science. Over 100 years ago, Arrhenius, Svant Arrhenius, worked out that if you take a population of molecules, that population of molecules, each molecule has an energy state. And if you look at the population, there are low energy molecules in the population, medium level and high energy molecules. And to complete a reaction, the molecules have to have an activation energy, a certain level of energy to complete the reaction. And if you warm up the population of molecules to a higher temperature, then a bigger proportion of the population can carry out that reaction. So the reaction goes faster. The equation that controls that is this, and we don't have to go through the derivation of that, but what it means is that a plot of the log of the rate versus one over absolute temperature should be a straight line. And there are now thousands of pieces of work since Arrhenius derived this relationship to show that that does work. It works in chemical reactions, it works in biological reactions, and it works for development. There was some classic work done in the 50s and 60s on development in frogs 
that showed that temperature affected their development in exactly this way. And there are lots of other pieces of work that show this fits. So if this relationship doesn't fit, something really unusual is happening. So to give you an example, I've taken the oxygen consumption rates of bivalve mollusks from the tropics to the poles and taken all of those data and plotted them on a graph, just a straight graph of oxygen consumption versus temperature. If we replot them as an Arrhenius plot, but only for species living above five degrees up to the tropics, we then get a nice straight line. We can then extend that line down to the polar regions, down to the zero degrees in the sea in the Antarctic, their average temperatures, and see if the animals living there fit the relationship. And for metabolism, they do. They're not significantly different from the extension of that line. If we look at growth, however, and these are data for growth in sea urchins from the tropics to the poles, and we plot the Arrhenius plot, all the Antarctic data are below the line. And the growth rates of the sea urchins, don't forget this is a log plot, so these are significantly slower. They're significantly slower than they should be for the low temperature. So something else is making them slow. It's even more apparent when we look at development rates. And these are development rates in gastropod mollusks from the tropics at 30 degrees down to where we are at 10 to 15 and up to the Antarctic. And these are brooding periods in weeks for these gastropod snails where it's maybe less than a week in the tropics, maybe two, three, four, five weeks where we are, but a hundred weeks for some species in the Antarctic. If we do the Arrhenius plot, all these data are below the line. And the average slowing for development for these snails is between five and 10 times slower than they should be for the effect of the low temperature. So something else is happening here. And we think it's a difficulty making proteins at low temperatures. And I'll show you some of the data that make us think that in the next few slides. But the basic biology is that every, temp every protein has an optimum temperature to function and an optimum temperature for stability. And as you move away from that temperature, the proteins start to unfold and become less functional or non-functional. Most biologists know that happens when you warm things up to high temperatures, the proteins fall apart, but it also happens as you take the temperatures down. So here are data for protein metabolism, and it's the fractional protein synthesis rate. And what that means is the proportion of the total pool of protein in the body that is made every day. So in temperate and tropical species, somewhere between three and 4% on average of their body pool of protein is made every day. And of that, they accumulate or use about 50% and they degrade, break down to amino acids to reuse about 50%. If you look at Antarctic animals and limpets are typical for Antarctic animals, they're making less than a percent a day, 0.6, 0.7% of their body pool per day. They're degrading about 85% of that and they're only using about 15%. And that's strong indication that the proteins they're making are not properly formed. If we look at what's called the RNA to protein ratio, so RNA is the signal to make proteins on a ribosome. And it's generally accepted that the stronger that signal, the harder it is to make those proteins. And we can see here that as temperatures get lower, the signal to, to production ratio gets higher and higher. So again, this is evidence that it's difficult to make proteins. There's more signal there to make the proteins. Every cell has an organelle called a proteasome. And this, the proteasome looks like this. And what happens is that when you get a protein that isn't functioning very well or is malformed, another protein called ubiquitin comes along and attaches to it and tags it. And that tells the cell that that protein's not functioning very well. It then takes it to this piece of machinery that breaks the protein down into amino acids so that they can be reused. So if we look at the activity of these prote proteasomes, we can see this in these data. These are data for Antarctic fish, 
the top two lines and for two fish species from New Zealand, one of which is a, is a close relative to the Antarctic species. And here we can see that the rate of functioning of this proteasome in the Antarctic fish is much higher than the temperate fish in the gill and in the liver. And these assays were at two different temperatures at zero degrees and 10 degrees. So these machinery for breaking down proteins are running at four or five times as fast in the Antarctic fish as they are in temperate fish. And again, that's evidence that the proteins are just not formed very well. If you warm up a protein, it starts to unravel. And there's a classical response in every organism on the planet. And that's called the heat shock response. And what happens is animals produce heat shock proteins, HSPs, to hold other proteins in, in their best conformation to work until the stress goes away. And up until the year 2000, this was called the ubiquitous heat shock response or the universal heat shock response. But then in 2000, Gretchen Hoffman's lab in America looked at an Antarctic fish and there was no heat shock response. Since then, Melody Clark's group in the UK has looked at a wide range of Antarctic species. And in most Antarctic species that have been looked at, there is no classical heat shock response. There's no increase in these heat shock proteins when you warm the animals up. And so they appear to have lost that heat shock response, almost certainly because they've been living at constant temperatures for millions of years. However, something else that happens in these animals is they're producing high levels of heat shock proteins all the time. Their constitutive standing stocks of heat shock proteins are four to five times higher than similar species in the temperate zones. And what that says is there's a problem with those proteins all the time at low temperatures. And it's possible that when you warm them up, you relieve some of that problem of the proteins unraveling, and therefore they don't need to make extra heat shock proteins. We just don't know the answer to that question yet. Activity rates. My group's looked at a lot of activity rates of Antarctic species over the years. And this figure shows the rate of an organism doing an activity in temperate zones at 10 to 15 degrees. And then what we've done is we've looked at the rate that that activity is done in Antarctica by an Antarctic species and plotted it as a comparison to the temperate species. So here we see walking in limpets, limpet locomotion. And we can see that on average, that goes at around about 0.6 times the rate of temperate related limpets. Burrowing in anemones is about, is about a fifth of the rate of temperate species. And usually most activities are two to five, six times slower than the temperate species. And that matches the expectations from Arrhenius. There are two activities that appear compensated for the low temperature. One is sustained swimming in fish, and the other one is burrowing in a clam. And we'll come to those soon. But before we go there, one of the slowed rates is predation. And it's, we looked at drilling predation in this snail, Trophon shackletoni. And there are Trophon snails across the planet in shallow waters everywhere, drilling holes into their prey, then putting digestive juices into the prey, digesting them, and sucking out the digestive juices. We run a three year experiment in Antarctica and our species takes 28 days to go through this process of eating a prey. In the UK, it's a week or so. In the tropics, it's a day, maybe two days, some species even less than a day. So it's really slow in Antarctica. In our three year experiment, the animals on average get 0.7 to two and a half prey items each year. Two animals at nothing for 30 months. One animal at nothing for 36 months and nobody at more than eight meals in three years. Of the animals that ate nothing for long periods of time, we'd got them labeled and we knew their activity rates and their movement rates were the same as all the other snails. And those two that ate nothing for 30 months laid broods of eggs in the last year of the experiment. So they clearly were not stressed. One of the things that low temperature means is that if you're, if you're that way inclined, you can just wait for things to happen 
because you're not burning energy. The temperature's so low that it's not forcing your metabolic rates to be high. So similar animals in the tropics have to eat six, seven, eight, ten meals a year. Otherwise, they run out of energy. In the Antarctic, that's just not so. So some of the unique adaptations that we see in Antarctic are our gigantism. This is a sea spider. And what I'm going to do now is show you a couple of examples here. And here we have an isopod from the Antarctic. And these guys are relatives of wood lice. And in the UK, we have sea slaters on our beaches. And those sea slaters are somewhere around three centimeters long. The biggest ones of these in the Antarctic are 15 centimeters long and getting on for a hundred times heavier than the biggest isopods in temperate waters. Even better examples are these guys, the sea spiders. The biggest sea spiders in Europe are 15 millimeters across. And as you can see from this one, this one's over 30 centimeters across. The biggest specimens are over 50 centimeters across. So this is true gigantism. They're around 5,000 times heavier than the biggest temperate sea spiders. So we have some real gigantism in Antarctica, in the polar regions. So we have sponges that are obviously bigger than your head. This species grows to be three meters high. And I know an American, Paul Dayton, who's dived looking at these sponges at 140 feet in McMurdo Sound, where there's one that's over three meters high and the diver can get inside the sponge. This is a sea gooseberry. It's a tenophor. And in most oceans, they're about the size of gooseberries. But in Antarctica, the biggest are around 70 centimeters long. And again, thousands of times heavier than the biggest in temperate waters and tropical waters. Sorry to interrupt, Professor. If you just reshare your screen, I think we've lost your presentation. Ah, OK, no problem. How's that? Are we back in? Not yet, no. Okay, let's go back to share screen. Are we now back in share screen? Yes, I can see that now. Fantastic. So here we have the sea spider again, the picnogonid. Those who have been observant amongst you will have realized the one I was holding up and the one in this picture has 10 legs. In all other oceans of the world, the sea spiders are eight legged, but in Antarctica, they've diversified and there are 10 and 12 legged species. 23 to 25% of the world's sea spider species live in the Antarctic on 10% of the world's continental shelf. They're more than twice as diverse as the average anywhere else. And sea spiders are more diverse in Antarctica than anywhere else on Earth. The sponges are bigger than your head. I've already talked about that. And here we have the sea gooseberries, up to a thousand times heavier than the biggest sea gooseberries elsewhere. This gigantism is allowed because the metabolic rates are low and there's more oxygen in the seawater. Nearly twice as much oxygen in polar seawater as tropical seawater. And that greater supply and slower use means you can make more tissues. The fish all have antifreeze. Fish blood freezes at about minus 0.5. So without antifreeze, these pictures of fish sitting on ice platelets just would not exist. The antifreeze allows them to live in seawater temperatures down below minus two which allows some species to use ice as a refuge from predators like seals and birds and penguins. It also allows them to hunt invertebrates that live in the ice. It was evolved in Antarctica 14 million years ago from a precursor of trypsinogen, the enzyme. Arctic fish also have antifreeze. And it's an identical molecule. But it's recently been shown that that molecule in the Arctic fish 
has come from non-coding DNA. So a completely different part of the genome. And that's one of the best examples of convergent evolution that anybody has anywhere. It's amazing that the molecule is the same, but it's come from different places. And antifreeze works by basically blocking the growing sites for ice crystals for water to attach to them. And it's almost like wrapping them in cling film. It just stops more water attaching. However, some of the most interesting adaptations are in this group of fish. This is a chanichthyid ice fish, and there are 16 species of chanichthyid in Antarctica. They have antifreeze like all the other fish, but this group of fish don't have red blood cells. They don't have hemoglobin. They are the only animals with backbones on the planet that don't have red blood cells and don't have haemoglobin. Many of the species, eight of them, don't have myoglobin in their muscles. So their heart muscle, their swimming muscles, all their muscles are pale and white and they don't have pigments to use oxygen. It means they survive on the three to 5% of oxygen that's in our blood and all of the vertebrates blood that's just dissolved. The other 95 to 98% is not available to them. They can only do that because the temperature is low, their metabolic rates are low. So these fish have metabolic rates around 30 times lower than similar fish in the tropics. What he also means is this solution to life's problems doesn't work if you warm them up because they can't keep their metabolic rates low if they warmed up and they die if they're warmed up by two or three degrees. They just physiologically can't cope. Their survival in the wild will be even less than that two or three degree window because their capacity to do things like forage and reproduce is crimped before they reach their physical limits. We don't know what their limitations are, but it's only going to be a very small temperature window. It allows these fish to have some very unusual adaptations to make themselves almost transparent. And it also means that if you look at them, this is the test tube with the blood of one of these blood, red bloodless ice fish. And this is the blood from a sister species in Antarctica that has red blood. Here's the heart of one of these fish and from a similar size red blooded fish. And the red blooded fish in Antarctica have larger hearts than temperate and tropical species. This heart is five times bigger in mass than a red blooded Antarctic fish. It's eight to nine, maybe 10 times bigger than a heart of a temperate red blooded fish. Another really unusual attribute is blood capillaries. And here we see blood capillaries from a red blooded fish. And the blood capillaries in all vertebrates across the planet are just about the same size. They vary by 10 to 15% in their diameters, except for the ice fish, where they're four times the diameter of the other vertebrates, 400%, not 15%. And again, it's a really unusual set of adaptations. So when I do my call for Let's be more worried about things in Antarctica than elsewhere. Losing these ice fish means we lose a unique biology. It's not like losing one of the big cats where there are other cats. It's not like losing an eagle where there are other birds of prey. It's not like losing an elephant where there are other elephants. This is a unique biology and it's right on the edge of survival and needs long-term constant low temperatures. So those are the adaptations. So the next question is, what can life do to survive when an environment changes? Well, they can cope within their existing biological flexibility called phenotypic plasticity. They can adapt to the changing conditions and become a slightly different thing, or they can migrate to where the conditions allow them to survive. So my group over many years has done a series of experiments where we've warmed animals up at different rates of warming. And each of these points is the temperature at which a population of a species in Antarctica failed. 
So each point represents a different species, and we've got about 20 species for each rate of warming. This is a degree an hour. These data are for a degree a day. These data are for a degree a week, a degree a month, a degree every two months, and a degree every three months. And as we get further to the right on this graph, we get to what are more ecologically meaningful data. A degree every three months means you're running experiments for well over a year. And that's something you can't put into a PhD project because you can't run long, long-term experiments. An 18 month or a two year experiment, one failure in that experiment, your PhD is gone. So we've had to run this in, in a slightly different way by using our long-term employed staff to run these experiments. They're very difficult to run, but the data are really interesting. What you do is you get a, a, a model that looks like it almost levels off. And we can do what we do with climate models and predict what it's gonna be for a degree a year, or a degree every 10 years, or a degree every 20 years. However, another way of looking at this is to say, what happens when you look at this long-term steady leveled off temperature limit. And this, if you like, is a temperature limit for a community because it's the average for 15 or 20 species living in that environment. And if we compare that with either the maximum temperatures that, are, that they see during the year or the average temperatures, we can look at what's their windows for survival. And we can do this across regions and we've done that looking at the same in the tropics in Singapore, tropics from the literature, in the Mediterranean, in New Zealand, the Arctic and Antarctica. And when for each place we look at this leveled off thermal limit compared to the upper temperatures that they see in their environment, we get this graph. And here in Antarctica, we've got a three to four degree warming allowance, window between what their physiology allows in experiments, in long-term experiments, and the temperature they see. And that's very similar to what we see in the tropics. Both places that we showed early on had very small temperature variation during the year. In between, in cold temperate, northern hemisphere, warm, northern hemisphere, warm temperate, Peru, southern hemisphere, warm temperate, we've got six to 10 degrees difference between the maximum temperatures they see and their physiological thermal limits. Really interesting is that if you look at Peru during an El Nino, that temperature comes down to temperatures very similar to the tropics and the poles. And this is when we see massive mortalities in many species in Peru during the El Nino. So what about life histories? How can the animals change in response to the altered environment? Well, Antarctic animals live a long time. They grow slowly, I've showed you, and development is very slow. So if we look at these three species as examples, maturity is deferred. This fish species starts reproducing at somewhere between eight and 10 years old and relatives or similar ecological fish in temperate zones, it's three to four years. This clam gets to be about three and a half to four centimeters long. It lives for about 80 years. It doesn't start reproducing until it's 20, 23 years old, compared to temperate species that are closely related that start reproducing at about three to four years old. These brachiopods live to be 50. They start reproducing at 15 to 20 years old, again, compared to temperate species of five to 10 years. So the generation time is long. And what that means is there are fewer generations where you can build new genetic material to adapt to the new conditions. Here are data showing that egg size increases with latitude. It's for this isopod. It looks like a fossil, but it's not. It's a cerulean isopod and they live in the Southern Ocean. And you can see at 60 degrees latitude, their egg dry mass is about three and a half to four milligrams. And as you go to higher latitudes, they almost double in size at the higher latitudes. There are lots of data now on several groups of animals, amphipods and nudibranch mollusks, for example, that show that you get much larger eggs in the polar regions than you do in warm waters. What larger eggs means, fewer eggs in broods 
and fewer eggs released each year. And again, that means fewer chances to evolve new genetic material. Most new genetic material is, comes about from mistakes in the cell divisions during, during embryo and egg development. So fewer eggs means far fewer chances for that to happen. And all of that means that Antarctic species have fewer chances to produce new adaptations. So in summary, our Antarctic animals, they have a wide range of unusual, unique adaptations, just not seen anywhere, and unique biology. They don't resist warming very well. Their rates are slow, and some things are much slower than you would expect for the low temperature. And it's almost certainly due to problems making functional proteins. The long generation times and fewer eggs mean they have poor abilities to adapt to change. And this fauna, these animals, are more out of sight and out of mind than anywhere else. So fewer people care about the loss of this unique biodiversity than anywhere else on Earth. Antarctic's a great place to jump in the sea and go scuba diving. It's a great place to work on the unique, unusual biodiversity that lives there. Let's hope the sun doesn't go down on very many species in the coming decades. Thank you for listening.